2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Once again, probably a very familiar passage of Scripture that you've all heard before. Uh, you've heard preached before, but simply talking about to revive us. You know, when we think about the word revive or we think about the word revival, we often think about a special week of services that are set aside. And, you know, we the, a special preacher comes in and, and, you know, Daniel gives the word of God and, you know, it's supposed to revive us. Uh, folks, we know that the preacher that preaches revival, he doesn't carry revival in with him in his Bible because the word of God that he uses is the same word that I use. We often think that we have to have a revival in order for people to, to get on fire for God, folks. But you know what? We shouldn't have to have that today. We should love Jesus enough to want to serve Him with everything that we have. And, uh, you know, when we talk about reviving, I just want to, I want to tell you this. It says, the very word says something that is alive but is about to die. You know what revive means. You know, if somebody is, is having a heart attack or somebody's, uh, you know, you give them CPR, you're trying to revive them. And folks, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to be quite honest with you today. There's a lot of Christians, they need a little wake-up call. They need a little revival in their heart. They need to be revived, not because you're going to hell, okay, not because uh, cause I totally believe once you have Jesus Christ in your heart that you're going to heaven. But you know what? Your, your, your heart's barely beating for Him. You're doing just enough to get by. You're doing just enough to, to get yourself into heaven, and you just need a good shot of Jesus in your life. You need, as I said, you need to surrender to Him, not just commit to Him, but to surrender to Him. It said, it's the struggling with life that needs to be awakened. If you're a Christian, if you're, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you don't need revival. You need regeneration. You need a new heart and a new life. But if you're here today and you're a Christian, I can promise you at some point in your walk with Jesus Christ, you're going to need to be revived. And folks, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I think this church, we need to check our pulse. We need to see if we're still alive. Got one amen at least. That's worth, worth something. Got one. But you guys know it's the truth. Okay, I'm... I, You've been around me long enough. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm just going to tell you exactly like it is. We need to check our pulse, and we're going to need to see if we're alive. We need to see if we're serving Christ the way that we need to each and every day of our life. Um, this passage of Scripture comes from 714, just to give you a little background in this, because I did just pick out one, one passage to actually speak about. But Solomon had already dedicated the temple um, to, to God. And uh, if you want to read the first few verses, they can. But basically, he prayed and fire came down from heaven. And basically, that fire, if I remember right, consumed like 22,000 bulls and like 120,000 sheep. That's how much that, that Solomon, if, guys, don't quote me on them numbers exactly. I'm trying to remember from uh, from reading it uh, the other day but basically he, he had offered 22,000 bulls or 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep uh, to God at, for dedicating the temple and God was happy with what Solomon done the Bible says that fire came down and bam consumed everything just like that you go on to the next part of these verses and uh, basically God had appeared to Solomon for the second time and, and, uh, and spoke to Solomon, and he says this in 714. Once again, it's probably a, f a very familiar passage of Scripture, folks, but let me tell you what. It's something that each and every one of us, I really hope that today, that you really examine your heart and your life, and you take a long, good look at your life, and you check your pulse and see, is it truly beating after Jesus Christ? Are you seeking after God with everything that you have? Because, folks, let me tell you what. A lot of us need to be revived. You're barely breathing as a Christian. You're barely getting by. You're living below the standard that God wants you to live below. And that's sad because, folks, I've said it a thousand times, God wants us to live at this standard right here, but many Christians are living at this standard. Why? Because you're barely breathing. You need to be revived. And this is how, folks, it happens right here in 714. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal 
their land. Uh, we're going to jump right on into this message, folks, because there's several things uh, that I want to speak to you here this morning, and it's simply this. If, we wanna, if you want to see a true revival come to your life, it starts with one thing, and it starts by being uh, broken. He said, what do you mean, preacher? Uh, what it means to be broken is simply this. When you reach the point of desperation that you know the only thing that you can turn to is God that's going to get you through that situation, folks. And I have been, many things have happened in my life over the time where I I have prayed to God and I said, God, I have no other plan, God. There's nothing more that I can do uh, to make this better. And Folks, today, when we need to look at our lives and we got to realize and say, God, there is no plan B in my life. I'm going to turn everything over to you. I'm going to seek you with all my heart. As we talked about last week, I'm going to, to run after you with all my heart, with all my soul and all of my mind and all my strength. And folks, when you realize that your only hope is in Jesus Christ, you will not be looking for plan B. You will not be looking for plan C. You will not be looking for the world that's trying to pull you away from him. You will turn to God. And folks, we need to be broken. It says the only thing, uh, the, uh, only a broken heart is big enough uh, for God to work in, folks. And that's very, very true. Only God can only work in a broken heart. You say, preacher, what do you mean by a broken heart? I mean a, bro a broken heart that you realize that you are a sinner in need of Jesus Christ. You are a sinner, uh, you know, in, in need of salvation. Or maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and there's so much pride in your life uh, that you can't get that pride out. And folks, guess what? God cannot work in a prideful heart. A prideful heart says, you know what? I can do it all myself. I can do anything that I want to uh, that I set my mind to today. And folks, that's where many of us are at today. Our hearts are so prideful that God can't work in them. Our hearts are so hard that we hear the truth of the word uh, Sunday after Sunday. We hear it on the radio. Maybe we read it for ourselves, uh, but it never soaks in because we have too much pride. We look around and say, you know what? I'm not like that person that's sitting beside me. Uh, that person beside me is not a good person. I'm not like the people I work with. I don't do bad things that they work, you know, that they do. I don't go after, you know, after work and I don't go out and drink, you know. I don't cheat on my wife. I don't do all these other things. And folks, pride is the number one thing uh, that kills a church because we are not willing to put down our pride. We're not willing uh, to step out so many times and say, God, you know what? I'm tired of the way that I'm living. I'm tired of the condition that my heart is in and I'm ready to get, be broken hearted for you. I'm willing to let you do uh, whatever, whatever it is that you want to do in my life. And folks, it's simply this. Broken hearts today are rare sight in churches today. We don't see broken hearts. And you know what? We don't see broken hearts. But you know what? We don't see Daniel. We don't see broken churches anymore. We don't see churches that are broken. We don't see people that are broken. We don't see people that flood to the altar, that come to pray for people that need Jesus Christ in their life. We want to sit back and we want to grab that pew till the preacher gets done so we can walk out the door the same way we came. Amen. Somebody, come on, folks. I'm right. I'm right. I guarantee I'm right because that's what the Word of God says that I'm right. So many today, folks, people are happy with the state of the church. People are happy with the way the church is going. Let me ask you, are you happy with the way the church is going to say, preach, you know what, I'm happy. Well, guess what? I'm not. I want to see more. I want to see people do more. I want to see people commit their lives more to Jesus Christ and what they did, what they did before. But they can't do it because they cannot get the pride out of their life. They just can't do it. They're too prideful. They're not going to do it. And folks, Jesus Christ will never work in a, in a prideful heart because he can't. Number two, it says, revival prayer starts by being humble. As I said before, pride can kill a church. But you will never find a time, folks, listen to this. You will never find a time in the Bible where men humble themselves and God did not listen. Never will you find a time where God, a, God, a man or a woman, whatever it may be, they humbled themselves before God. And when they cried out to God, you know what God did? He heard what they had to say. Listen to what Daniel 10 and 12 says is, Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before God. There's two things. He, Daniel wanted understanding, and he said, You humbled yourself before God. Your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. When you, folks, when you humble yourself before God, he will respond to you. He won't just say, oh yeah, my, my, oh yeah, my servant down there, he's humbling themselves. Well, good for him. God will respond to you when you humble yourself. 
Revival prayer starts with urgency. Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13 says this. Actually, it's kind of funny. I read, this, I read these very same verses in a devotional this morning right back here in my office. And 29 and 12 and 13 says this. Then you will call upon me, go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Folks, when you pray, God listens. God never turns a deaf ear to his children. When my kids need something, I do not turn a deaf ear to them. I listen to what they need. And folks, the God that you serve and the God that I serve listens to my prayer. It tells me right there. It says, you will seek me and you will find me. Folks, when you go looking after God, you'll find him. He ain't hidden somewhere. He ain't somewhere in the back 40 hiding from you, wanting to play hide and seek. If you go looking for him, you'll find him every time. He's never turned his back on you. He said, when you search with me with all your heart, folks, there's a little condition there. you got to do something. you got to go after him. you got to go find him. you got to go searching for him. And when you do, you'll find him every time. God desires to turn his church around. Folks, listen to me. This ain't my church. This ain't your church. This is God's church. It ain't me. It ain't you. I'm not the one that makes it go around. You're not the one that makes it go around. But guess what? It's God the one that makes this church go around. And his desire is for this church. It is desire, folks, for all churches, the church down the road, the church up the hill, the church down the hill, that they be turned around. But, folks, we can't turn it around until people get their lives right. Until we get revived. Why can't we start to revive ourselves right now? Why can't today you say, you know what, I'm going to really look at my heart, preacher, and I'm going to turn my life around. But many people say, not today. Today's the day that I'm not willing to surrender my life to Christ. Today is not the day that I'm willing to turn it all around because, you know what, I love my life right now too much. But God desires to turn his life around. But you know what it usually takes? It usually takes one person. It takes one person that gets serious about serving the Lord. And it takes one person that says, you know what, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, and that's what we need today, folks. We need a lot more, uh, we, <laughs> we need a lot more men to lead their families and say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Because folks, if you don't serve something else, you'll serve, you'll serve the world each and every time. But it can start with you. Revival starts by praying and seeking His face. That's what we just read. I want to read you a little illustration right here that I found. It said, David, I believe it's Huxley, <clears throat> excuse me, owns a world record for an unusual category. He pulls jetliners. On October 15, 1997, he broke his own record at Mascot Airport in Australia. He strapped around his upper torso a harness that is attached to a steel cable some 50 yards long. The other end of the cable was attached to the front of a wheel of the 747 jetliner that weighed 187 tons. With his tennis shoes firmly planted, excuse me, on the runway, he, he he leaned, he leaned forward, pulling with all his might. He was able to get the plane rolling down the runway. In fact, he pulled the plane 100 yards in 101 minute and 20 seconds. A superhuman feat. The church today resembles a 747. The strength of a few, folks, listen to what I'm telling you right now. A strength of a few extraordinary humans or extraordinary Christians can pull the church for a very short distance. Or we can pray until God starts up His powerful engines, enables His church to fly thousands of miles on the wings of the Holy Spirit. We have the choice. I can only do so much. I can only pull this church so far. Me and the deacons can only pull this church so far. Me and the people that, that's here and doing what we need to do, we can, only, I, we can only do so much. But it takes each and every person doing their part. And folks, you know what? If each and every day, each and every person would do their part, this church would look radically different. It would look radically changed. But you know what? It's just a few of us chugging along every day. And we're just, we're pulling it, but it's not going very fast. But if everybody done their part, folks, the church would be, hey, do you realize how powerful God's church could be? And it ain't the power of the people. It's the power of the God that we serve. Every day I tell myself, Jeff, just trust. Every day I tell myself that God, nothing is impossible with you. 
You can do anything. You can do way beyond what I could ever imagine. I can imagine the most craziest thing folks could ever happen in this church. And guess what? My God can do it. He can do whatever He wants to. There's nothing. But I say, God, you've got to work here and here and here. And you need to work inside of this box. And we keep God inside the box. And He never does nothing extraordinary in these churches because His people don't believe. People don't believe. Think about it. Listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. And if you're going to be here on Wednesday nights, you're going to hear this very same thing. So guess what? Where you need to be at on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock? Here. That's where you need to be. Every great revival, folks, that ever started in a church, and I'm not talking when a preacher comes and preaches for four or five Sundays or three or four Sundays and walks out the same door. You know where, you know where things really start happening? Things start happening when people humble themselves and they fall down upon their knees. You know what they do? And they pray 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 some more. That's when God starts to move. When you get your heart right with God and you begin to pray and pray and pray, folks, things begin to happen. It does. What if we all did that every day? I want to leave you with just one couple more things. The Bible doesn't say preach without ceasing. The Bible doesn't say worship without ceasing. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Never, ever give up. But folks... Most of our prayer lives look like our Bible reading lives. Kneel to none. They don't exist. Think about that. The last thing that we must do, and I'm going to keep this pretty short because you guys don't, this ain't rocket science. You need to get the sin out of your life. Get it out. Be tired of it. Be tired of living in sin, being tired of being a sinful person. Does that mean you're not going to sin every day? No, you're still going to sin. It's going to happen. That, that does not mean that you live in it, that you go back to it every day. You try to get rid of it and you turn it over to God. As we talked about in Sunday school class this morning, folks, God, God, when you forgive, you know what? When you ask God to forgive your sins, you know what He does? God turns His back on your sins and He never remembers it ever again. He never, he forgets it. He's done with it. But what do we do? We go and we pick it back up. Ah, I want that back again. Let me take that sin. Mm, I really like that sin. I've talked, said this morning, you know why we sin? Because it's pleasurable. If sin wasn't pleasurable, you wouldn't do it. That's sin, plain and simple. If sin wasn't a pleasure, I wouldn't partake in it. But I, sometimes, you know what, Randon? I like it. Because it feels good. It looks good. So guess what? I partake in it. We all do. Every one of us does. It doesn't matter. But the Bible tells us in Psalms 51.10, this is what we need. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Folks, God needs to... God needs to clean a lot of our hearts. Our hearts need a lot of dusting off. Our hearts need... A lot of our hearts need a lot of hard cleaning. They need, really need to be cleaned up. They need to be scrubbed to get our hearts back where they need to be. But do you want it today? Folks, we all have known sin in our life. Every one of us. Get it out today. Be tired of it. Be tired of living in it. Be tired of wallowing in the filth and the mud and the nastiness. Be tired of it and say, God created me a clean heart. I want a clean heart. How bad do you want the sin out of your life? Do you want it out of your life or do you just want to continue to waller in it every day because it feels good? You saying, preacher, you mean if I turn it over to God, I'm never going to sin again? Nope. Because you're going to sin the next day and the next day and the next day. You know what you do? You try to avoid it all you can, and every night you say, God, or whenever, God created me a clean heart. God, forgive me. I'm going to try to do better than what I did. Folks, if we tried to do better than what we did every, the day before, guess what? It would get better and better every day. But we need to be doing that. Folks, I'm going to tell you what, it's easier said than done. But we need to do these things. We need to have brokenness. We need to have a church that's broken for people. We need to have a church that's it's urgent about getting on with the business of God. And we've been talking about that. And you're going to see some things coming down the pike here pretty soon. We're not quite to that point ready, but we're not quite ready, but we're getting there. 
Whenever I think God gives us the okay, we're going to go for it. But folks, some of us need to be revived. Because if you check your pulse, you're barely beaten as a Christian. you got one foot in the grave and one, one, one above. Your head's just like this. You're barely surviving. God needs to revive us. God needs to revive this church. But folks, I'm going to tell you what. God needs to revive a whole lot of other churches just besides this one. We're not the only one that's in this, I'm not going to say, we're in this state that we're in. The state of, of happiness, a state of contentment, a state of I'm happy with what I'm doing. It's a lot of other churches. But why can't it start here? Why can't it start with you? Why, for one time, can we not get serious about serving the Lord? About being in His house, about studying His Word, and letting Him create a clean heart in us. I want everybody to do something. I don't know what we're going to do. Take your hand and put it right there on your wrist and see if you got a pulse. If you got a pulse, you're alive. God's not done with you yet. Let's go on, church. Let's go on. Let's quit wallowing around the way we're at. You know, sometimes, I'll just be honest with you, I feel like it's every time something great happens, I feel like it's one step forward and two steps back. And I say, God, why? What in the world another do we have to do? God says, Jeff, just trust. Just trust. That's all you got to do. 